What's up, y'all? Today I'm going to show you how to make a hand-built teapot using some basic techniques like pinch potting. So I've weighed out some balls of clay here. That's what we're going to make the teapot out of. Um, that big ball there is about a pound and a half. So you make a perfect sphere, cut your sphere directly in half. So you have two equal halves, and now we're going to make a couple of pinch pots. Okay, to make a pinch pot, just get your thumb in there. Push down, hold the clay in your palm, turn and squeeze, turn and squeeze. And try to push your thumb down into the clay, otherwise you'll get more of like a plate shape. We're trying to make two kind of half spheres here, like like, coke, like two halves to a coconut. So I'm just pushing, pinching, pushing my thumbs down, turning and pinch. Place the clay in your palm, turn and pinch. Um, this way we can get them really nice and even. You want you want to make them nice and even. You can see there I didn't quite get them to fit, so I'll just pinch that other one out a little more. And I'm working with about a little less than a half an inch thickness. And you really want to make sure you get a nice even thickness throughout. Here's the smaller half. This one was a little under a pound. Um, if you pinch a lot of pots, uh, you're going to get carpal tunnel eventually. So here's another way of doing it. I just take my paddle there. Kind of paddle it, and now I can pinch it a little. I don't have to pinch it as much, though, because I paddled it. And then another nice way of doing it. Take your finger, push it in, roll. Push down with your finger of your right hand, roll the clay with your left. Or if you're left-handed, switch it up. Roll it out, pinch it. You want to make sure your two equal halves are going to meet up. And leave a bit of volume at the lip there where they two join so they have a nice broad surface area for slipping and scoring them together. Now we're going to make a spout. So first thing I'm going to do, roll a little bit of a tapered coil. And then I'm going to take one of those dowels there, take the metal one, shove it through, kind of squeeze the clay, push it through. If you squeeze the clay, you kind of feel it, the dowel moving through. Try to get it right through the middle then roll it on the table, okay? Really basic way of making a spout. You can pinch it a little if you want, if it's a little too thick. Take a bigger dowel, roll it again, okay? If you kind of move the dowel through it as you roll it, it's gonna elongate it. So now we're gonna make another one. So when I hand build these teapots, I, I end up making quite a few components. So, you know, I'll make maybe three spouts, three handles. Um, so that way I have some options when I'm making the composition of the teapot. Okay, here's a longer one. That's a chopstick there, folks. Chopstick works really good. Good tool to have in your arsenal. Shove it through, roll it. Okay, that one's a little longer so I can kind of bend it. But uh, one thing I like to do too is cut, cut pieces of your spout at an angle. If you cut it at an angle, then that allows you to manipulate the angle of the spout. You can see that one teapot in the background with three sections spout. This is how I made that spout. So it all comes off of one original spout, but then I cut that spout up with these chunks with these like 45 angles and that allows me to, to make a more animated spout with some bend in it. Um, so now we're going to do some handles here. I already pulled one. Um, I'm just going to roll another taper coil and I kind of throw it down on the table at a little bit of an angle to kind of elongate the handle. Okay, this is a really easy way of making handles. Um, the benefit of doing it this way rather than pulling a handle with water is the spout, the, uh, handle, excuse me, doesn't become super soft. So I got a little bit of water on my hand and I'm just kind of pushing it. Now I'm going to put a couple of grooves in there just to give that handle a little more shape on the surface of it. I'm going to set those aside and let them dry. Now, as I'm making all these components, I'm taking them over and I'm putting them in front of a fan to kind of expedite the drying of it. Now I'm rolling another coil. This is another fun way of doing handles. Roll a nice long coil, cut a few sections, and then we're going to twist them together. There's just so many different ways of doing handles and everything. Um, and that's what, again, why I like to make multiple parts so I can make a few different styles of handle. 
and then I can kind of pick which one I want to use. So this one I have just three pieces of clay, and I just kind of twist them together. Okay, one of the coils, I put a line down the middle there. You can see it there. Um, just kind of nice, fun little way of doing handles. And again, I, I give it like the basic bend that I think I'm going to want, and then I let them set up a bit. So you gotta kind of make your components. Here's another way of doing it. Squeeze the clay. And then it makes this cool pattern. I mean, that's something I started doing back in high school, in the 90s, when I was making my handles like that. Kind of fun. Looks kind of, reminds me of like a backbone or something. So now here's that other spout. I let it set up. Now this technique here is called darting. Um, and it's when you cut a, a triangular shape out of the clay and then that allows you to manipulate the shape. Um, I can kind of close it down a little. So now I'm just gonna slip and score there where I cut the dart out, stick it together. Cause I was thinking that that spot was a little too wide at the base. So that closed it off a little bit. I'm gonna do it exact same thing on the other side there. There's the other piece. So it's pretty much the same. Slip and score it and then stick it together. So now that spout's a little smaller. You can pat a little, little if you want, push it on the table. Really make sure you work in your seams when you dart. Really work those seams in. Getting a little more bend out of it now. Still kind of a funky shape, a little wide for me. So another way you can dart is this way where you cut out like that diamond shape. Okay, to cut that out, slip and score it, and then I can stick that together. And that closes it down. So now I have even less volume in there in that spout. So again, this is why I make multiple spouts, multiple handles, multiple body parts for my teapot. So I have some options. So you make all these components and then you let them get leather hard. When it's all leather hard, then you can join them all together. So now those have sat in front of the fan for a while. They're almost leather hard. So I'm just gonna slip and score those two halves together. That was the bigger chunk, the bigger ball which weighed about a pound and a half. So now it's about softball size. It, it went from like tennis ball to softball size. And again, I'm leaving them a little under a half inch thick um, because I'm gonna wanna carve it later on. Um, so I want some mass on there to take some material. So I just, you, when you slip and square the two halves, push them, squish them together as hard as you can without just flattening your ball and then where they where the seam is really blend that seam in with one of your a wood trim tool works really good um, here I'm kind of pinching the seam together um, sometimes I'll do that where I kind of pinch the seam and I take my metal rib I really like the metal rib it's one of my favorite tools and I can just kind of bend the metal rib to fit the curvature of the ball the sphere and then really blend in that seam and get it all nice and smooth so I'll go through and I'll get the whole sphere nice and smooth and there's that that one half um and you can paddle stuff paddle the form you know particularly if you've let it set up a little bit you can paddle it now i'm trying to work on my composition trying to figure out here what i'm going to do so this is the teapot body here that we're looking at right now um so now i'm going to cut a little bit off of the smaller one, an angle there because the bigger one's gonna key in. Now that I've got that cut, the seam on the inside, I can blend that seam now on the inside. Um, the seam that was where I slipped and scored the two halves together. So here I'm just blending that seam. Now that fits in there, kind of keys right in. You know, now I can start kind of thinking of this composition. Smoothing it, pinching it out a little bit more. Um, now I'm going to cut that part. Uh, I can take the little piece I cut off there to kind of measure to make sure that it's the right size. And I'm going to cut that piece off. Now these have gotten leather hard, so keep that in mind. A lot of times when I sculpt, I let my components get leather hard. I really love clay when it's leather hard. That's the magical stage of clay. It's great to work with because it's hard enough to retain its structure, to have some structural integrity, but yet still soft enough to slip and score and paddle and texture and carve. Um, it's just a really great stage in the life of clay, that leather hard stage. 
Um, a lot of times when I'm sculpting, I'll make two pieces at the same time so that as I'm working on one, the components for another one have time to get leather hard. So now I'm going to slip and score this these two halves. And what I like to do is just kind of dabble some water and then score and dabble a little more water and score, and that creates slip. Um, the other thing you can do is just make some slip. You know, that's a great way of doing it too, where you can just brush the slip on after you've scored a combination of thereof. You just want to make sure that if you're doing the dabbing water technique that you don't get water pooled up anywhere on your clay. You never want to leave water sitting in your clay because it can cause a weak spot and that can just cause cracking in your clay. So I'm just pushing those two halves together. Figuring out how I want this. Paddle, paddle, paddle. Paddles are great tools. My paddles were adopted from a Korean paddle design. My brother, who's a woodworker, actually made them for me years ago. Now let's put, this, let's put together a spout. So I've decided to go with um, the three halves that I cut out of the one long spout. Um, so I'm just going to slip and score these chunks together in a way that I find pleasing to the composition of the teapot. So remember, this was all the same spout, and I just cut it at angles so I can get some bend on it. So it looks like I'm thinking something like that. So slip and score them. Um, I always get the, get the inside nice and clean, try to, when I've scored like that, so I don't leave a bunch of schmutz in there. You can get your, you can get your dowel in there to help clean them out. Push it together. Use quite a bit of pressure when you're connecting your clay. You want to hear the, the slip kind of squishing out when you push them together. And then blend. Always blend the seam, too. Um, this clay I like to use a lot of times to supply it for the college I work for is a, the WSO. It's a high-fire uh, stoneware body with a light grog. That's just a really nice clay to work with. And uh, it bisques out to be pretty white. So now I'm marking where I'm going to put my spout. So that's where my spout would go. When we make teapots, what, what I like to do is perforate where it goes. Instead of cutting one big hole out, punch a few smaller holes in there. Um, there's a number of reasons why we like to do this. Um, one reason is if you have a tea bag in there, the tea bag doesn't go flowing down into your spout. Another thing it does is it slows the speed of the water coming out of your spout, which can make it pour a little better. Um, just don't make your holes too small, because if you make them too small, there's a chance when you glaze the thing that you just might glaze your spout closed. So my holes there are about a quarter inch. Um, and I'm just going to open them back up there. You can make more than three. You could do six, or you could make them a little smaller and do more. I mean, it's really up to you. Just remember, when you glaze the thing, to not glaze those holes closed. So now I'm just got my spout there going down. And what I'll do is kind of blend where I have put it on there. And... Um, I'm going to roll a little coil. I'm looking at my handle there, trying to figure out the composition. I like to look a lot of times at the negative space that the handle and the spout creates against the body of the teapot. I always find myself looking at the negative space a handle creates on a mug, between the body of the mug and the handle, or on a teapot, or on a anything like that. I'm always looking at the negative space it creates. So I'm adding that little coil around there just for a little added strength. So I just rolled a little coil, and I'm going to blend it in around there. I'll make it a little bit of a stronger connection. And this whole thing is designed that you can just use the basic tools that you get in the, that basic pottery toolkit. Um, we kind of require our students at the college I work at to at least purchase the basic pottery toolkit. Um, 
I prefer Kemper. I think Kemper is the best, like some of the best quality tools out there. Um, if you can pick it up from your local art shop, I kind of suggest doing that rather than um, Amazon or something. But so I, I skipped a scene there. I've got the I've got the uh, knob on the top there for the lid. I put the handle on, um, and now I'm going to cut the lid out. So for this basic sort of hand built teapot. Um, we just can cut the lid right off of there. Um, so I just traced out kind of the shape. I want it could be any sort of shape you like. Um, just cut it slightly at an angle, like a jack o' jack o' lantern when you're carving a pumpkin, like a jack o' lantern. Um, just a slight angle across the front there. I usually cut it straight down because um, it helps keep your lid on better. But around all the other sections, I'm kind of cutting in at it like an angle. You'll see here when I pull it off of there. So I kind of cut it at an angle, okay, like the jack-o'-lantern lid, except the front there I cut flat across the front because that'll keep your lid from slipping out when you're actually using your teapot. If you've cut across the front at an angle too, there's a chance that your lid is going to slip right out of your teapot when you pour tea out of it. So try to keep that in mind. Um, what's nice about this technique is it's a really easy way to make a nice tight fitting lid because you're just cutting the lid right out of the top of your teapot. Now I'm blending the seam there where I join the body together in the middle. So just blending the seam down there and I'm taking off some material so it fits nicely. There we go. And so the knob there I made out of just the scrap of what I cut out of the two body halves. Now I'm kind of thinking feet, hmm, how am I going to do my feet here? Um, what's nice about making teapots is you can really give them a lot of character. Um, one of the things I like about doing a teapot assignment, that you can really animate the teapot, you can give it a lot of character. Um, another reason I like to teach a teapot for a beginning class is... Um, this is multiple parts coming together, so it teaches you how to make multiple parts and, and then slip and score them all together. And then also uh, the significance kind of of a teapot too is, is cool conceptually. You know, it's an object that brings people together and creates conversation. Um, so now I'm rib, I call this ribbing it out, ribbing it out. So I've got my metal rib. Um, it's, it's nice and leather hard. I'm just taking off some material. Um, and I'm going to do this until the whole body of the teapot, the whole teapot actually is nice and smooth. So I'm going to rib all the components, um, for not really much of the handle. I don't have to take much material off of the handle there. But uh, the whole body, I'm just going to sit here for a while and rib it out. And if you're my student, you've heard me use that term before. And uh, again, it's just kind of scraping the surface making the surface of your object nice and uniform um, so that you can then come through and decorate it if you want. Um, it just helps take some material off, makes it lighter, but also makes it more smooth and kind of clean looking. Um, I really like to try to make everything look intentional. Um, so I don't like to leave like a, a nick by accident or a thumbprint. Um, on, th on this sort of, for this sort of practice. Um, if you've seen some of my other work, like the Unomis I make, those are more unintentional. Those are just kind of letting the material guide me. But for this project, we're really focusing on manipulating the form and getting it nice and smooth and, and uniform. Uh, so here I go, just taking the material off. I honestly didn't forgot that I included this much of it in the video, but I think you guys get the point. Um, now I'm going to do the spout. Now see how I'm kind of holding the spout so I don't break it off. I'm bracing it. So I'm coming through and kind of taking a lot of material. And again, remember early I, how I said I made everything a little thicker because I knew I was going to come through and take a lot of material off of the teapot. Now I'm now I'm getting into the texture. Um, and I'm not really thinking much about this texture. I'm just kind of having fun. I'm just 
take a material off again, lightening the teapot, adding design aspects. It's coming through and it's kind of scraping it. Just, just having fun with it. Um, I really like texture a lot. I've always utilized a lot of texture in my work. Um, I just feel like it helps make the surface more dynamic and a little more uh, unique when you put a lot of texture in. Got to remember to hold the work in the frame while you're filming so you all can see what I'm doing. So I'm just kind of scraping away, scraping away. And it, it was quite heavy until I really started taking off a, a lot of material. Just going around here. Taking off some material. I'm not really thinking much about the surface design at this point. I'm just kind of having fun with it. let go of my expectations a long time ago and I just have fun when I make stuff like this. Now let's do some lines on the uh, spout too. Let's put some lines on there. That'll kind of make it a little more cohesive design, surface design. So I'm just kind of scratching it away. I made the spout kind of thick too. Now this is a very important little trick for your teapot lid. That little that little tongue I'm putting on there will help my lid hook on so that when I'm actually using this teapot, the lid doesn't fall off. So I've just taken a little bit of clay there, made a little kind of 90, de 90 degree hook sh shape. I'm gonna slip and score that on, you see, and then that will help the lid. See how it won't fall off. And since I've cut it flat across the front of the lid, the lid won't slip out when I pour it. See, so that just allows the lid to not fall off when I'm actually pouring tea out of this thing. See, nice little trick. And now I'm gonna put my feet on. I like to put my uh, teapots up on feet. And I got the sponge there. Um, it's nice to have some foam in the studio where you can lay down your pieces on their side. It won't damage your piece. If you just lie it on the table, you, there's a chance you might damage your piece. So a, a, a sponge works pretty good as a, you know, something to lay your piece down on. If you need to lay it on the side, um, a nice dry sponge works well. Um, if you can find yourself a, a piece of foam, it's just a great thing to have in your studio, an old couch cushion or something. Um, where'd I go? What happened here? Hmm. There we go. So I'm just slipping scoring the feet on. Um, I like a, a number of reasons I like feet. A, it animates the teapot more. B, it lifts it up off the table. And C, it creates some negative space under the piece as well. And if you recall earlier, I was talking about always creating negative space when I can because I like that for the composition of sculptures and teapots and stuff, creating that negative space. And I'm just blending those on, slipped and scored and blend them. There you go, and you got a little feet now. Put the lid on, yeah, there we go. That's how we do it. Oh, and then I always like to come through with a damp sponge when I'm done with my sculptures and just kind of sponge everything out and clean it all up. Um, a damp paintbrush works really great too for going over like design work and stuff. But here I'm just kind of lightly sponging it down with a damp sponge. It just really kind of cleans everything up and makes it look really thoughtful and um, nice, pretty much. So that's looking okay. And that was all made out of like just a few pounds of clay. Sponge it down, sponge it down. Thanks for joining us. Hope you learned something. And uh, give it a shot. That's the hand-built teapot. Thanks for watching. Peace.